Steve Buscemi was also one of the guys in Spy Kids, which had a really good quote. And it was like, wait, yeah, yeah, you know the quote. Uh, people reference it all the time. It's like, do you think God hides in heaven because he too is afraid of what he created? That's him. <laughs> yeah. What? <laughs> Go look it up. It's Hold that's on, Steve right. Buscemi. People always quote that, and then it's dash Steve Buscemi parentheses Spy Kids. I think too. <laughs> do you think? God stays in heaven because he too lives in fear of what he's created. <laughs> Whoa. Uh, future me, insert Man, the, insert the clip of awesome. him saying that quote. Thank you. Just Very send deep. this to Kelby really quick. Anyways, welcome to episode 14 of the Actually Nothing podcast. Welcome back, everyone. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's been a minute. A real minute. But we've been busy because... You have just finished, well, are nearly done becoming a master of music. A master of piano. From now on, I want everyone to refer to me as Master John Paul. Master John Paul. I'll yes. give you a little fanfare when I say that. Please. Master, yeah. I would really, really appreciate a, a bit of a... title change comes with Ortho Dr. JP. As soon as that happens, though, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to insist I'm... Ortho Doctor Ortho Doctor JP. But for reals, dude, congrats! Your, your concert was amazing. Yeah, I did a. I, I had a. I had a recital recently where I played about maybe a good hour fifteen worth of music. One of which took up one third of that. Yes, like a literal half hour straight. It was rad, mm-hmm. and I, I think I sweat through all of my clothes doing that. Like my shirt was soaked afterwards. And now all you need to do is finish the rest of your classes, right? Then you're. So you, you got the title. You'd think it'd be so easy, but like the la- the next two weeks are just going to be like hell for about like the rest of it. Oh. I'm going to have one day of repose, which is uh, two weeks from now. I graduate on the fifteenth, and I've just decided like I'm just going to get sloshed for most of it. You deserve it. Just wake up at ten. Just go straight into it. <laughs> nice. You know, just wake up. No coffee or Irish coffee when you wake up. Yeah. You know, just then. 11 a.m., four beers. Mm, and then we'll, and we'll see. <laughs> no breakfast, just beers. No, no. Have you ever, have you guys ever heard of beer eggs? No. Mm, no, but that sounds like a bad idea. It sounds like, I, I've heard it sounds like a smelly idea. Actually. See, I think you're right, but I've heard it's really good. It's like you make scrambled eggs, but with beer. Mm. I've never tried it. I, wait, no, wait, wait, like you use beer in the scrambled eggs yeah. when you're making them? Yeah. Oh, I thought you might like just eat straight eggs and then like chug beer. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's <laughs> disgusting. <laughs> Hardcore. See, that would be like a really cool shot to take, like. <sighs> you you uh you take a you take a, a you crack an egg into a thing drink the egg yolk raw and then you chug a beer. <laughs> See, but like <laughs> Roxy mixing, on the rocks, <laughs> using beer for food makes sense when you think of like beer batter. Yeah, yeah, I guess. But I don't know about straight scrambled eggs. I feel like that's a little weird. I don't know. If you make a good batch of it and try it, let me know. I'll, then I'll have some. I'd like to just like copyright that thing we just made, calling it the Rocky Balboa. <laughs> Rocky on the rocks. Rocky yeah, rock. a straight egg. Don't steal. OC, do not steal. Yes, yes. This, yeah. this is OC now. Uh-huh. Anyways, but that's why we've been gone for like a month. Yeah, so we, we have no time to record. We really appreciate whoever you are and all your patience. Yes. But we're also, back. I wrote a thing at the top that I wanted to do personally at the beginning of every episode, but it was give a shout out to each episode. Give right. a shout out each episode to somebody you appreciate, no matter. How big or small? That's very gracious, yes. and I appreciate that. Let's see. Who are we going for today? You also, first. we should probably introduce ourselves. Well, I don't know. I'm Aaron. That's JP, and Dan is also here. Yes. yes. In, case there's, in case there are people who are listening for the first time, which I didn't really think about before. This has been the classic crew. Listen to all the other mm-hmm. ones, too. Anyways, you want me to go first? Yeah. We'll uh, be grateful for I you. wanted to give my shout out to my friend, Neil. I don't know if we should include last names. If we can, I'll just bleep it, whatever. Okay. But he is one of my really good friends from high school. Followed me into college also. But he just moved out to San Francisco, who, and he's now doing engineer work for a uh, a magic show. Whoa. Very, yeah, he is, he's really cool. But he also runs um, a little game project thing called Indigo Grove, where he makes up these mysteries, 
and has people solve them on his Instagram page, and then he sends them like ten bucks if you get, solve it first. It's really cool. Wait, so Indigo Grove? Indigo is Grove, him? yes. I'm plugging it because he specifically asked me to. I got followed by Indigo Grove, and I'm like, I don't know who the hell this is. Yep, that's him. Oh, I'm so go Neil, and, there you go. Let me go. Just say, let me just give him a good old follow right yep, now. Yeah, there you go, Neil. You got a new follower. That's literally one in one minute. So. Yep. But Neil, there's your shout out. I promise to you, Dan. You got a shout out right now. You got anything, Dan? Just be smaller. Just be like, "Hey, Dad." <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, Dan's ungrateful. He doesn't care about people. What yeah, about right. you? What about you, Gabe's? Um, <laughs> shout out, my JP. Shot- Hell yeah! Hell yeah! Hell yeah. What's up? <laughs> my shout out will probably be as uh, is, is going to be my girlfriend Kelby Aww. because Aww. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, she had a she did her her recital as well right before mine, Ooh. and it was just a huge endeavor, and it's just so good to be done. And I know it was like super stressful, but like she made it, and then she's uh, next year she's going into law school, so it's just a big jump. Yeah. And so, just big shout out to Kelby for doing it, nice. making it real. She getting sloshed too. Probably on the same day. Nice. Yeah. I feel like nowadays life is just figuring out excuses to get sloshed. Yeah, and then getting sloshed and being like, I'm never doing this again. <laughs> yeah. That happened to me the other week. I was like, oh my God, I can't do this. You got too drunk, but then you're like, oh, I got too again. drunk and then I had to teach the next morning. And so, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> hey, I taught, I still taught well. So yeah. it's not a bad thing, but definitely like not, not the best life decision I'd made in that in the <laughs> recent past. Timmy, what did you learn today? John Paul smells like alcohol. <laughs> John's Paul, John Paul smells like a dad after more. seven. <laughs> Great. Yeah. I like this. I like gratuity. And I like the shout out. It's like a helps us keep keep in touch with who yeah. we remember. It's like, like acknowledging that people exist, which other people tend to like. But it's like it's like practice gratuity. Sometimes yeah. it's kind of campy, but other times it's like really good to do on a regular, like even in your head, doing it on a regular basis mm. like helps in general. Right. One, it's keeping our engagement up with our audience. Yes. And two, also fills in some time in case we don't hit an hour. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not an issue with us. Now we ramble. Yeah. But anyways, on to, on to the topic for today. Yes. Topic for today is because specifically my friend Tim wanted us to talk about technology's impact on society. So technology and society... I mean, and we had been talking a little bit about this and just how broad the sort of scope for technology and society really, yeah. you know, really becomes. Because if we think about it, at, at any point in society, like technology has been something that we've used to push forward immensely. And you can, you can look at a lot of different, I guess, events in human history where technology has been the primary, I guess, uh, catalyst for lots of progress forward in development. And so like in trying to talk about any sort of relationship between technology and society, it's almost like we need to provide a disclaimer that we're not going to hit everything. It's more of like a cursory conversation about what the big things we think about when we think about the relationship between society and technology. It's like asking somebody what is life? What is the purpose of life or something like that? It's like such a blanket question. Or even like... You can't really tackle all of it in one go. Yeah, or even like a question where we talk about what has the internet done for all of humankind? Yeah. It's so like Let me multifaceted. Just pull up the Wikipedia page for real fast. <laughs> I know. I mean, that'll give you a general idea about what's happened, but it won't give you the full gist. And I mean, like the scope of this sort of question really allows for lots of cool conversation, but it is one of those things where we're not going to get to everything. Yeah. And so if, if any of you do, who listen to this have like other things to say, tell us. Yeah. You know, give us, give us an email. The Instagram page will have it too. Just if you have any other, any other things. But, I think like when you talk about technology and society, it's important to consider like the big things that have happened. And Mm -hmm. so for me, like those big things, those huge events with technology are like being able to grow crops and being able to like move into being a society that really revolves around crops and around wheat and rice and sort of things that you use uh, agriculture and farming to grow. I think that's like one of the biggest steps because without that, you don't have modern like collective peoples you don't have like large-scale governments who basically allow for the dissemination of all of these things i think the first big thing with technology is like that you know where when as soon as we were able to utilize 
crops and agriculture as a real sustainable method for feeding large amounts of people, that was when you moved into these huge collections of people, you get larger societies. And so I think like in any conversation about this relationship, this is the basis, yeah. right? And, and it's sort of cool because when you use this as the basis, technology becomes a uh, an idea that's centered around not just like how we colloquially think of technology, not like, you know, tech type of stuff, but all of these methods of innovation. So like agriculture, medicine, uh, military, mm -hmm. what else? Communication, entertainment, any, any of these things fall into this blanket of how technology interacts with us. Yeah. But so that was, that would be my first thing to recognize as a relationship builder between technology and society moving from a hunter gatherer society to just established communities that can sustain themselves by growing their own food. Absolutely. Yeah. And this even, you know, extends to like the utilization of tools, you know, as, as an innovative thing, it's like, like caveman era, discover fire and the wheel. Sure. If you want to call it that, I mean, like, have we all seen uh, 2001 Space Odyssey? Yes. So there's that one scene well, I where the... <laughs> well, so there's a scene in that where, like, this ape thing, like like a humanoid, like, thing, picks up a, uh, a bone and then figures out all of a sudden that they can use it to smash stuff. And then after that, what follows is them using these bones as weapons. And so, like, even that is kind of an example of, like, the, the innovative power of, like, "Quote unquote technology, mm -hmm. right? Man, using tools as weapons, I feel like that's like one of the earliest uses of technology too. Because yeah, I mean, first it would probably be tools to get food, and yeah. then tools to attack other people those to are get kind more of like, food. Yeah, those are kind of the only two things that I can think of. I mean, if you think about it, society dwells on the fact that." multiple people are living at the same time and in order to do that you need food mm -hmm. so the easiest means to get the food is tools so there's your technology in society for early neanderthal mouth breathing humans <laughs> <laughs> right yeah that's a good point in terms of like military warfare because like the relationship between technological innovation and people's will to kill each other goes, goes back like about as far as well. And I, my, the big one that I think about is like the development of like catapults or trebuchets. trebuchets. <laughs> I knew you were going to the, go the, the superior siege weapon. Yes. Um, <laughs> ballistas. Or even like modern day, or not modern day, but like the, the use of like metal weaponry, refining metals into weapons. Or even like when people found, like figured out how to use gunpowder as a means well, of oh, like... Oh, that was a game well, yeah, dude. I mean, yeah, I suppose Instead so. of one stick, somebody went, let's have two sticks with, a, <laughs> with the God. string in the middle. Yeah. yeah, Which I've also heard, by the way, is really realistically one of the most impractical weapons because you can't really oh, always yeah. predict where the the bounce back is if you're actually swinging it. Have you seen Bruce Lee, though? All right, well, <laughs> yeah, but he's like, like, yeah. he's a, 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 like an outlier. With that, yeah. that I'm pretty sure was doctored footage, but even if it wasn't, I would believe it because it's Bruce Lee. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I want to believe it's true, yeah. so I'm gonna let it happen. But anyways, have you have you seen that one? Uh, to make another reference that kind of pulls on the imagery of this, there's an episode of like Looney Tunes where it's it's Elmer Fudd and Bugs Bunny, and they keep running at each other with bigger guns. Yeah, that's kind of how I understand like technological innovation and military warfare. Yeah, like everyone goes, oh shit, they've got this thing, and so now we need a better thing so we can beat the shit out of them. That's too. small tangent. That's kind of what. All international conflicts are centered around now is just one upping each other with uh, who has the most nuclear weapons. I mean, has uh, like that's always been like this yeah. too. And Ever in, since in it came into play, of, yeah, yeah. Like World War Two. I have even like before it too, using oh, yeah. using weapons as just like a means of showing off your like huge military balls, like <laughs> you know, like you just got the big fifty pound military balls <laughs> that are much heavier than your forty pound <laughs> military balls. <laughs> But I think that's like a legitimate way that people have used technology to innovate themselves yeah. as a as a tactic of warfare. It's I just mean, a like dick measuring contest. Yeah. I mean, tech, yeah, but I mean, also we can take another example. Like, do you remember Oppenheimer saying, like, you know, I'm now the destroyer of worlds when he came up with like nuclear, nuclear yeah, yeah, nuclear yeah, weaponry, fission, and yeah. and even then, like that nuclear weaponry that they used, you know, on the Japanese cities is nothing compared to what they had tested later on. Oh yeah. You know, like just the sheer amount of like 
pure destruction you can create with those things. And like you had said, it just became one of those things where everyone's measuring their their length, mm -hmm. seeing they're like, just trying to scare each other into submission. Yeah, and I mean like the idea of a nuclear holocaust being like an imminent threat in the fifties and sixties is like a result of this uh, relationship between technology and society. Mm -hmm. And like in, in this sense the the relationship almost like puts people in the most uh, I guess worrisome of perspectives because like when all of uh, all of human livelihood almost depends on like a press of a button or like world leaders not pissing themselves off too much yeah you where know. they can fire off nuclear military weaponry there's that little story of I think it was like a Russian Russian guy or some some soldier in World War Two who they I don't know if the story is true or not, but it's like the man who saved the world because he refused to, That's right. to fire the missile, which probably would have just sent everyone like to just fire shit at each other and blow up everything. Oh, wow. But he, because he didn't, it's kind of attributed to like, well, if, good thing he didn't because everything would have gone to shit if he did. Yeah. But that's kind of scary to think that it totally hinges on just a couple people pressing a button and then mm. everything just blows up. Yeah, and, and it's like, it's that sort of thing where, like, technology really becomes, if, if you think about it in that sort of light, technology really is one of those, like, objectifiable tools that you just learn to use, where it's it's like in that instance of 2001, the bone is not a bad thing. It's not inherently a bad or good thing, it just exists, but the ability to use and the ability to discern how to use is one of those things that really is the pivotal moment for its relationship between it and yeah. humans. Just by existing, it has consequence on something larger than itself. Yeah, without yeah. being objectively good or bad, it just mm -hmm. is, right? Yeah. And so, like, that's one of those things where, like, I, I think, especially with the development of modern warfare, like, technology and its development really becomes, like, the basis for, like, deeper metaphysical questioning. Yeah. Like, whether or not to create this sort of thing or whether or not the creation of these things is necessary what it means to create these sort of things and how they can be used. And and that, you know, overarching one of like the thing itself isn't anything but a thing and and sort of like it falls on. <laughs> My brain just shorted out really quick trying to process all that at the same time. Isn't anything but a thing. It's not a thing. It's not anything but a thing yeah. to be used. And, and and like put all like, you know, diminished all the way down, it becomes just like the tool itself. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. The tool is just the tool. Because people don't think it be like it is, Dan, but it <laughs> but it do. do. <laughs> okay. To put it bluntly, yeah. Thanks, Black Science Man. <laughs> Who is that again? It was Neil deGrasse Tyson. He said that. I don't know if he actually did, but it's the meme. Hmm. But I mean, that's how I've kind of understood like that part about technological yeah. innovation. If we're gonna ring it back to regular everyday civilian life, though, I've always heard the concept that whatever consumer technology we have, the military has developed like something 10 years into the future. Hmm. So like whatever they currently have, we'll have in our hands in like 10 years or something like that. See, yeah. and Which I wouldn't doubt if it's true or not. Cause I mean, if you have the world's smartest people constantly working around the clock to develop things better than other countries who are also trying to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Of course, just by that fact alone, you're just egging people on to make the best stuff possible and probably not going to be able to mass produce it for, every regular citizen until it's like inferior to what they have now. Mm -hmm. I had read something really interesting about that sort of concept, but in reverse where um, all of the large scale technological processes that have happened since about the seventies are the result of military grade dissemination through uh, like people. Hmm. So like uh, the first example was the television. I think the television wasn't inherently used for like the public, it was originally intended for military use. And then when they realized they could market it, it became a thing for a, like an innovation in entertainment. Yeah. And, and it's the same thing with the internet. The internet, it started as like a network to be used by like international governments and to be used by military. And it was known as the ARPANET for the longest time. And then finally, when it was, you know, available for mass use in the mid nineties, it became a, a place for marketable space. Yeah. Right. And so it's that sort of thing too, where like, the military technological innovation is one aspect of it, but also like how that gets used and how it gets thrown into like entertainment and communication for humans is another aspect of it as well. Yeah. So it's kind of like once it falls into civilian hands, it gets transformed into a different beast altogether, which is more suitable for everyday living. 
Yeah, and I would say like it it, it goes into that, but also it, it's more about commentary of how uh, when anything is marketable on a mass scale, of course it's going to be marketed yeah. to hell and back. So, and that's another part about technology too is like how easily communication can be like just pushed, and how easily things can get marketable, and how easily like anything can be for profit at this point. Yeah, like Apple, right? Their whole shtick is pushing the the next big thing on their already identical device that you probably bought like eight months ago. Yeah. <laughs> when reality, if you guys look at it, I'm not trying to bash Apple too much or anything because every company does it, but they don't even necessarily make huge leaps forward for their next item because they kind of purposely hold back on things that should have already existed on the pre-existing model. But just because they're adding something that wasn't already on it, it's like, mm-hmm. oh, here's a new version. I think the corporatizing of Apple really is shown in that sort of respect because like, they're, they're, they're trying to hold off on any sort of thing and, and taper all of their innovation so that they have things to sell. Yeah. And it becomes one of those things where innovation isn't the game anymore. It's all about marketability, right? Because if you don't have marketability, then your profits disappear. So that's probably why they're not... While they probably could give you the iPhone that has literally everything you need, then that means you probably won't buy one for the next five years if there's no new improvement on it, right? And why would they, why would they sell you something you, you need? Like, why would they sell you one thing that has everything you need? They'd want to sell you five multiple things, things yeah. that have the needs that the other things don't have, mm-hmm. right? And so, like, mm-hmm. it's not a practical business model to be selling a cure-all yeah especially when it's like so graspable the freaking dongle man those things are terrible yeah (laughs) yeah we were talking about in the car ride how peter he had his third party dongle and then he was using it and it worked for a period of time but after a certain amount of time it said that it's no longer supported yeah the software is no longer supported i mean this kind of is just rolling into a big rant now but it's just like how instead of holding off on technology for the benefit of the consumer then it becomes more about profits and profit driven i mean of course corporations want the money but then it starts to get into really greedy territory and then apple specifically with all their proprietary things like the lightning charger whereas micro usb exists USB C exists and that stuff is compatible with literally anything that has that port so much easier but apple is just like no let's use this instead because then they can charge you up on the more expensive version that only works with their technology. So, mm-hmm. But I think this is good commentary about how technology, technology and society have merged together in a mm-hmm. very specific way nowadays, where technology, let's, let's think about how we discussed technology beforehand. Technology up until, well, for a long time was all about innovation mm-hmm. in the sense that like we're trying to push comfortability and convenience, right? Yeah. And I think in a lot of senses, like the way that people use technology and view innovation was more you know, at first about survival, more about survival, you know, try or about being able to push your clan past another clan or trying to keep people alive in the terms of medicine. Mm. And then like in the 20th century, you see pushes towards like, or even even before that 19th century, you see pushes towards, uh, actually, I can't even say 19th, before that, way before that, you can talk about technology being used for the sake of convenience, for the sake of artistry and for the sake of expression. Technology mm-hmm. works in that way. And I think nowadays it's interesting to see technology being used, not expressly for this, but in a lot of different ways as a tool for marketability and as a tool to be able to sell more and, and as ways to like go into going into the internet and finding these profiles and being able to sell. And as a very characteristic part about how humans use technology, this is a very telling you know, I guess, way that we use it. And and the change is like pretty substantial too. Technology, while still being about like convenience and longevity at this point, also has an equal stake in being about trying to sell things. Mm-hmm. And and it's like the sort of chimera of that, I think is one of the most telling things about us as a, a group, Yeah. right? So one of the things that I was just thinking about in relation to that is um, you're talking about innovation and I mean, I can't speak for it because I don't, I can't see the future, obviously, and I don't really understand the scale of how fast technological advancements occur, um, whether that's military, medicine, or just random civilian stuff. But it does, I mean, you guys can have your opinion on this too, but doesn't it kind of feel like technological advancements, at least for civilian use, is sort of like stagnating a little bit? Like, 
maybe maybe on a bigger scale, let's look a couple decades back, like when the first when the radio first came out, right? Revolutionary. Uh, TV comes out revolutionary, and then we're at internet now, right? Absolutely revolutionary. We already said probably the single most important invention that humans have made up to date. Like without it, modern society just doesn't function anymore, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but we've already been at the internet stage for a while, so it's kind of like, what else is there beyond the internet to do other than refine it? You know, like it's not so much that we're going to find a, well, like I said, I can't see the future. Maybe there is something that they're developing and that I don't know. I don't know, holograms or some shit, but uh, (laughs) because, because technology seems like it has slowed down or at least it's advancements, the jumps and leaps that it has made previously are slowing down. It seems to me more that everyday consumers are starting to become more aware that now companies are selling it to them for, like you said, entertainment or uh, just to sell it instead of being like this is something you need to survive or function in everyday life Mm -hmm. because like how many times have we already said everybody has cell phones right and now instead of coming up with a new communication device that'll be integral to everybody they're just coming out with different versions of the same thing Mm -hmm. and that's mostly because they're like well the new biggest thing probably isn't going to be out maybe you can make an argument for things like VR or something like that. Like, of course, the next there's, step yeah. is going to be the smell of vision. They try. Did they actually try that? And like, is that a Futurama thing? TV smell of vision. I think that's like a legit thing that they tried. <laughs> like, they would spray like scents or whatever. But like, even then, right? Like, <laughs> but I mean, like that that could never work. Yeah. Right. Like, just based on on how like olfactory reception works, it could never happen that way. <laughs> yeah, like, that's right? what you think. No, that's that. It could never happen like hey, that, right? You don't know the future. <laughs> but 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 you see what I mean? Like like even no. even that smell of vision thing is kind of just a tangent to pre-existing technology that's already around. That's just it's the telescope, but with the nose. <laughs> yeah, oh. but it's like unless we come up with something where we can create matter out of thin air, then like mm. what's the next step? Like I said, what do I know? I'm just a regular person who doesnn't actually but know also, what th- all I, smart people are doing. I think that question is almost unattainable in the sense that, like, when people didn't know about the TV, could people have guessed that? The yeah, TV? that's true. You know, mm-hmm. like, we're in that spot. We're, like, you know, we're, we're, trying to, we're trying to guess for the TV when we don't know the TV exists mm-hmm. yet. And I think that's one of those positions where if you knew, you wouldn't be here in this spot. You'd yeah. be, like, working for the government or something. That's true. Like, creating some sort of weird shit. That yeah, pushes. all the hover cars in Back to the Future probably... Well, actually, they kind of do. Exa- I've seen, like, videos of people that are, like... It's just not practical. No, I yeah. mean, no. So it could be... Maybe it could be the case that the technology, it does exist, but it's not practical for everyday use or the methods to disperse it to the wider mass isn't available or just in a term in a sense of marketability they don't know how to sell it to the mass public right yeah like it's there's like they don't know what they have there was that one thing it's like silicon valley um and i make i'm making a bunch of references tonight but like so are you familiar with are you familiar with silicon valley the show yeah Yeah, a little bit it's like the whole premise where the guy doesn't know he has something really big until he shows it to somebody and somebody unlock like Somebody who's not a main character, just his sort of background unlocks the potential for what this guy's program can do. So he's he's been using this program, hoping to do something else with it, but doesn't realize that the program on its own has this sort of like unconventional merit that could really push things out of like out of proportion. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how, you know, a lot of things work where. Nobody really knows what they have until like some right person comes along and spins it and is, and says, oh, this thing would be really useful here and not here where it's intended. It's kind of like how the real people who make the most money aren't the people going to dig for gold. It's the people who just who figure out that they can sell shovels or mm-hmm. pickaxes yeah. to the people digging for gold, right? It's, all, it's a different sense of marketability and how to use technology not, and not about actually making it it's like the the businessman not the laborer right yeah, yeah. It, and which is and that's like a really cool image as well just because you know it, it really showcases how the use of technology that has changed many things over like humankind has been like both a both a combination of what we need in the moment and what we need to be different but then also like 
how we can use it and how we can apply it to different aspects of human living. Right. Mm. And so like us trying to figure out what the next big technological leap is going to be is probably one of the most unfeasible things we could ever hope to attempt just because we, without knowing what the technology is, we couldn't ever put a spin on something we don't know. Mm -hmm. Right. But it's kind of, it's kind of cool seeing this because you start to piece together how like technology and innovation as a resource work together in these sort of weird puzzled sort of ways where Mm -hmm. they all merge together to become like aspects of human, like human characteristic. Right. Yeah. Also the thought about somebody else finding the potential for something that the, the, another aspect of something that somebody else already found, but that elevates it to the next level. That is kind of just innovation in a nutshell. Right. Yeah. Discovery of electricity. It's not like Thomas Edison himself would have figured out every single use for electricity. That's why, the idea went out and then all the other smart people started finding other uses for it. And then eventually you hit a new technology, which could or could not be revolutionary. It was Benjamin Franklin, you fool. But I think talking about and thinking about that gap between how we understand technology, technology as an innovative like source, but then also how innovation as a concept isn't, isn't technology itself is something really worthwhile, mainly because I think, creating new technology in itself is a part of innovation, but innovation as a means, like as a whole idea, doesn't necessarily encompass technology. Mm -hmm. But I think when we think about the gap of what those two can, or what the two mean together, it's like, it's almost like technology is born out of the necessity of something else. Mm -hmm. Right. And, And, you know, they always talk about inventors, not, I don't know who they are, but like people always talk about inventors as like, not these insanely brilliant people all the time, but people who make things that people need that you don't really under, you don't really know you, you have a need for it as of yet until somebody makes it Mm -hmm. right. And that sentence in itself is for me, the perfect uh, sentence that combines the innovation part uh, and technology together as both like a necessity and a marketable like thing, right. Being able to use that sort of, thing that people don't think they need until they see it it is part of like characteristics of how society works yeah necessity is probably an even bigger part of it than we are giving credit to it considering if you think about r&d research and development pretty much all major companies probably have some department dedicated to it to improve their products or whatever right did you say r&d yeah Yeah. that's what it's called research and development that's just like the general term in the like STEM field, I guess, if that's what you want to call it. Yeah, man, I have a music degree, so I don't know anything <laughs> about that. But yeah, so one of the things is a lot of time, well, for pretty much every case, you need funding to get that research and development running, right? Like how, how you, can't, you can't run tests and trials without money to get all the materials that you need for it. So it kind of just makes me think how many things either are not yet developed or were scrapped completely because one of the higher ups decided either our company or people in general don't need this thing. And like how you were talking about most of the important technology comes out of a necessity to fix or solve a problem that's pre-existing. It's just like, think of all the cool shit that probably could exist or could be in our hands right now. If people were just like, Oh, you want to make this cool thing? Here's like a million dollars. Nobody really needs it, but here's funding to do that. Mm. And I mean, obviously there are people out there that are trying to do that. That's like Kickstarter and Shark Tank, right? That in a nutshell. It's just like, I don't know, food for thought. Because I always like to think of what people would be able to create if they had unlimited funds. Like I'm sure we'd see hoverboards and stuff like that. They got me thinking about those Microsoft AI commercials. They always have those like, oh, Microsoft AI. Yeah. They have the German lady and she's like, we create the new beer. <laughs> you see? Cheers. Yeah, right? But like things, projects like that probably are oftentimes do fail or like fall flat and stop continuing on to their next generation because maybe they got pushed out the door for their first iteration. But then mass consumers or the stock market was like, yeah, this isn't selling anything. And then maybe the future potential that it might have had if it was developed further, you know, three or four generations online is just not there anymore because everyone was like, yeah, we don't need this or it's like it's pointless. But like it might have been something cool to have. I mean, we have smart homes now. Alexa is like a thing that a lot of people have. And 
first generation of it probably wasn't that good. Like voice recognition technology. We we kind of recognize that. Like the DS back in the day, one of our games that were like speaking to the microphone, oh, you yeah. probably wouldn't pick it up. And now you can tell Alexa to say Despacito in a Russian accent. She'd be like, yeah, I got you. And then she would do it. But that was only because one of the higher ups or everybody decided this is cool enough or uh, makes my life convenient enough that we're willing to put more money into that. And then that's why that got developed more and more. Hmm. An interesting thing that this made me think about was you had, you had put up the idea about what if people had like a million dollars to do whatever they unlimited wanted. Unlimited funds. Unlimited funding to do anything. And I almost want to say anyone with unlimited funds probably wouldn't create anything, right? Ooh. Only because like, you know, without the need to do it, what's really like, how are you really doing anything? And I think when you have unlimited funds to do something, you uh, there is no box with which to push against. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like you can't decide how you're going to break out of the box if you don't know the box is there. And so it's one of those things where like, unless you're providing this this necessity, like by offering unlimited funds, you, you sort of make a different route outside of the box by like using your unlimited funds elsewhere. Yeah. It's right? like solving the problem before it exists, right? Yeah, so and it. it's like you're not you're not a uh, you're not giving an adequate impetus for solving the problem if you have nothing to push against. So I almost think that like this sort of, you know, struggle to get funding or this struggle to figure out what it is is partially the reason why things get invented or why things get innovative. Because if you have all this money, you know, let's think about in in terms of entertainment. I think if like a lot of people who were entertainers or even composers or whatever, or writers had like unlimited amount of funds. I think it would be the sort of things that they would come up with would be vastly different in a sense that, in a sense that they struggle against something that they cannot see and they cannot feel that could have been assuaged with some sort of funding. Mm -hmm. I think without, without that, you know, you don't get the characteristic uh, expressions that people have in, in, the sense that they push out from it. Yeah, that's true. It's like limitations sort of give birth to creativity because people who are in that situation are trying to find ways around the issue within the confines that they're given, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's true. If you're, if you're just like, have a bajillion dollars, now solve world hunger, then you'd just be like, well, let's just give everybody else a bajillion dollars so now you don't need to worry about it. Well, I mean, hypothetical, right? I'm I'm just trying to come up with bullshit examples. But I think this imagery is. Idea. I think this imagery is also like why things happened the way they did, or why technology came about in the way that it did. Mainly because people had a very tangible box with which to push against, and so people, when when confined in a space, get creative, and so you have all these things that can happen or did happen because people had a box and had to get out of the box somehow, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I think this really comes into play when we talk about technology as both like an industrial and as a, you know, a medicinal innovation. You know, being able to, uh, being able to figure out how to increase the efficiency of industry really pushes, people, uh, pushes society into a different realm as much as, you know, using technology as a way to, uh, to like, I guess, increased longe longevity or the convenience and comfortability of life, mm -hmm. right? Those are two, those are two things that will never stop being a thing. Yeah. People will always be sick and like industry will basically always exist, yeah. you know, and efficiency for industry is always something that people are going to be pushing against constantly. And the ability to like prolong life and to keep people healthier is always going to be a thing that we need in, a, you know, excessive amounts yeah also partially because if you're one of those believers in big pharma <laughs> um which has some credibility because i would say it does yeah absolutely because i kind of have an inkling that there are a lot of medical issues that could be absolutely minimized for a bigger i guess audience than it already has but mm. just because those companies are like where's the money right they kind of purposely hold back on some of it well, I mean, let's price let's, hike on insulin is a great example. I was going to say that's the recent one that's probably the biggest thing we have to talk about is like the hike on insulin, yeah, at which was just capped in Colorado at like a hundred dollars, wasn't it? Mm. But so, like, even then, we see the intersectionality of like met of technology as being both useful in medicine, you know, as a way to heal people and to and to push longevity in life, but then also as a marketable thing. You know, technology becomes this marketable thing that people can use to make more money 
And I think like what we draw from that whole experience is that not only that pharmaceutical companies like are in a sense trying to create market level things so they can sell a lot more, but that it's a sort of manipulation of technology in a way that's almost borderline. Well, no, it's not it's almost pretty it's bad, very unethical. Yeah. Hmm. Right, that's just what happens when you get into a position of power and you're like, Oh, you kind of just want more money at that point. Right. I, I, I hope that whoever listens kind of gets the thread here. It's that technology in, in all of its sense is really merely a tool and that using it for any sort of marketable means really pushes it in that sort of realm of unethical quality. There's a very fine rope to walk between doing things for the benefit of the common man versus profit for your company or for yourself. And technology like really speaks towards the brilliance of like humanity, but then also its use and how we use technology as this like, you know, multifaceted tool. I mean, that's what it is as a concept how we use it is sort of like another telling idea about what we, how we are. Yeah. Like it's also kind of fucked up how people just use it as a bargaining chip to the rich get richer type thing. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's kind of why they say if immortality is ever achieved, that'll probably be exclusively to the rich because those are the only people that'll have the money or the, the weight to achieve that. Right. Mm. Not that I'd want to be immortal anyways. I feel like if I were immortal, I'd be the person that gets really bored after like 500 years. I don't know. I don't know. Like if I were ever immortal, I'd probably like get good at a bunch of stuff. Really pointless stuff? Yeah. I'd probably get good at swimming. <laughs> I don't know. Like <laughs> For only the first swimming? like 200 I'm not, I'm not years go- of your life and then you forget. <laughs> I'm not good at it. Later. Like I just, you know, I, I, I can swim, but I'm not good at swimming. Yeah. Probably something else too, like uh, juggling. <laughs> you know, you have some, you have like time to do things. You might as well like learn, like, like Napoleon Dynamite says you have to have skills, yeah. right? Oh, yeah, Nunchuck yeah. skills, you computer hacking skills. skills if yeah. you're immortal. <laughs> <laughs> See, like, I think that would be, that would be where I do anything. Yeah. Think of all the games I could complete and not rush to try to play other games on my backlog because I would have unlimited time. You mm-hmm. could get all, you could get like all the achievements unlocked yeah, or exactly. whatever if you're an Xboxer. Yeah. You'd look like that one. Have you seen that picture of that one soulless guy who was like, he has the highest Xbox or PS4 uh, trophies <laughs> in the world because he's scored so many things, but he looks dead inside. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I'd end up like that guy. Jeez. Which is a great segue into I te- see that guy now. <laughs> That's awesome. Like I was saying, great segue into technology as an entertainment Ooh. and how it pushes entertainment. Because we like when we think about technology entertainment nowadays, what do we think about? What's our like go tos? Movies, streaming. Well, most recent. If we're trying to order it, it would probably be like streaming services at the or where we at right now. Mm-hmm. Um, I already said radio, television, and then I was gonna say cinema, but that kind of rolls into those two. Yeah, and then. I don't know, is internet the jump after that? Because then it becomes more consolidated and easily accessible to... I would say internet's a little too broad. I would say in terms of entertainment, like the things that I think about most of all are like the music industry, okay, um, video streaming industry, and then things like video games. Okay. I think I think video games oh, yeah. is like a really huge aspect of technology as like an innovative force to create worlds and to create these escapes, you know? Yeah. I think I think video games are so interesting primarily because of this quality where I mean and in the sort of base foundational thing about video games is that they do afford this escape mm-hmm. outside of the natural th- like you know trudge that you'd normally go through. I do want to have a whole dedicated episode to well there'll be a fun video games episode and then one that I'd like to talk about more like detailed stuff with this. Okay. But I was thinking um, if we're just breaking up the entertainment into technology, yeah, maybe there are like three major categories where it'd be movies, music, and I guess now video games, right? Yeah, I would think so. Just in the sense that you know we're not we're using video games in this in the same way that people would use music or books a long yeah. time ago, where like the, people would use them to create worlds and to be and to escape into these worlds. And video games, you know, basically do a very similar thing 
where they allow you to dissociate out of reality into this like sort of created atmosphere. Oh yeah. And that's, and I mean, if we even look at VR, like we're getting ever closer that's to that sort thing. of matrix sort of bullshit where now we've taken away the entire aspect of seeing anything else but the game and but the created world. Mm -hmm. And so I think video games in this respect hold a very high place in how technology interacts with like, you know, social norms. Yeah. Um, and on that account, now that VR is kind of a thing, Quick tangent, I don't think VR is the future. I think it has a future mm -hmm. because I don't ever think console or regular peripheral gaming is ever going to go away just because there are so many things that are already established in that sort of development cycle that why would you eliminate that since everybody's so used to it already? Mm -hmm. And then of course, there are some things that you can't play or develop without having a keyboard or a controller in your hand. Like, mm -hmm. like, that's just certain limitations. But one of the things that I was going to bring up was that as video games are getting more advanced with regular technology, like VR is a cool thing. A lot of people think VR, people who don't play video games specifically, think VR is pretty cool outside of its applications within the video game realm. Like a lot of times you'll see commercial VR as a concept for things like having meetings with other businesses or using it to build construction sites and things like that. And it's a very interesting crossroads to see that Video game is dipping into technology that is outside of, I guess, what was formerly just seen as gamer culture. And now it's because it's be appealing to a wider audience outside of just the target of young people, um, especially now that us, the people who started with video games, are getting older. So now they're, I guess, gamers at every age group now. It's sort of more widespread and acceptable in society, much like comic book movies. Mm. Like how we were, we talked about that before, how MCU has made comic books and I guess if you want to say becoming a nerd in quotes is kind of a cool thing now, whereas before people thought it was just childish because that's kind of how it had to be marketed at the beginning, right? But now that those people are more uh, mature and older, now everyone's like, yeah, it's kind of a normal thing. Hmm. Yeah, and I think the fact that, especially in cinema where you find the ability to market towards a certain user base or a certain group of people. I think you see this sort of innovation as being a tool for that sort of marketability again in, in cinema, especially with the, with the MCU and especially with all these superhero movies coming out. It goes into the same thing that video games try and do as well, where you essentially take yourself out of every day in favor of like building this atmosphere and building this world. And I think comic books and comic book movies nowadays achieve that where instead of having to do regular things with your life all the time where, you know, you're part of this like everyday grind that sort of sucks a lot. Um, you can go to these movies and you can sort of associate yourself with the hero and become the hero. And, and so you know, the cool thing about modern cinema be, being so technologically advanced and being and taking all of these hints from video games, from animation, from all of these crazy things is that you can literally create anything you want in the, in the movie theater. And, and when the movie becomes like your, your vision at this one point, it's so easy to just, you know, slip into that world. It's like there was like articles written in the 18th century about how opera was like, you know, this crazy thing where people could disassociate themselves from the natural world and just become part of this opera and associate with the characters. And I think the same thing is true of modern cinema. I think cinema in general, where you can dissociate yourself from being in the world and you're part of this universe now. And I think that's one of the really cool things about modern cinema is that with technology being so advanced, they can create these worlds almost effortlessly and make them look very realistic. Yeah. You know, it's not tricks anymore. It's the actual thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, while we're on this topic of entertainment and technology crossroads, you're right. I, I would strongly argue that a vast majority for the reason of why entertainment exists in the first place is escapism. Yeah. Because there were people who were sick of, like you said, the everyday grind. And now that technology is so easily accessible to everybody and that the common person can make some pretty cool stuff, it's so much easier to, to continue to make creative ideas that eject you from your daily grind. And that's why you get really cool movies and video games and even songs that try to pull you into things. ASMR. Yeah, whatever. Folks. I kind of say that. Is that a technology? It kind of is. I mean, 
split if you think about it like splitting the audio channels into the left and right was a thing that existed but then somebody went hey that kind of sounds like somebody's speaking into my ear and then they just rolled with it further until it became a really weird thing that you can use to quick quietly speak into your ears and have oh, i already did an asmr do you have do you have any tin foil we can use this time <laughs> uh, Maybe we can do like here like, something like what? yeah that uh, I, you, you have to talk in your sultry voice. <laughs> I'm uh, going to mash this already eaten bag of potato chips. That's chips. sultry? Who wants that? <laughs> yeah. I think it's, the breathiness really adds a lot yeah, to yeah. that one. We, I was having a conversation about ASMR, and it's just like the, one of those very obscure things. Oh, yeah. You know, like, and I mean, if you like that sort of thing, like, good on you, but like, it's still very odd. <laughs> mm. I th- I think um, I like with this, with the whole, ad- what? <laughs> yeah, we're just trying to be all inclusive, yeah, dude. All inclusive. Yeah, I mean, teach their own. I don't give a shit. Yeah. Um, while we're here, though, I think technology and entertainment, I, I've wanted to talk about this for a long time, and I think, I mean, it's something that, we recognize, but not always talk about. And it's how technology is always like paired with big developments in music. And I think when we think about music as being uh, an art that depends on new technology, I, I think you know we, re- we really come to understand how new sounds and new genres get created. And I think one of the, the most obvious ones is like the 40s and 50s when, they co- when you come out with amplified sounds. And I think the amplification of sound really plays into rock and roll. You don't get rock and roll without amplification because amplification changes so many things about how the natural ensemble works. And so like, you know, small history about this, like in the forties you have like, you know, these jazz musicians doing lots of crazy things and, you know, they create different styles of jazz that are definitely different from the popularized forms of the thirties. When you move into the fifties, they these forms are already getting a little old and so now you have amplification and people start messing around with the order of things and people put different instruments in different places and inevitably you come up with this uh this ensemble of like a amplified guitar amplified voice maybe like an electric bass maybe and i think like what we don't really recognize is that's the creation of rock and roll it was this use of amplification and this use of technology to bolster a different type of music. And in the same way we can talk about classical music uh, similarly, lots of music nowadays um, is electronically created. You know, why, and, and I think the, one of the prevailing ideas is why would anyone use um, acoustic instruments when you can get an electronic instrument to do it precisely the way you think it should be? Mm-hmm. And that's like one of, the, one of the most wonderful things about it is that you can use technology not even as you know as an escapism, but also as a, a means of abstract expression. Something so explicit and so precise that you don't need acoustic instruments anymore. And I had a friend tell me that's sort of the original conception of music is that I have this idea that's you know idealistically or I- ideally you know this one thing. And rather than having uh, like if I have a violin play it, it'll sound really good. It won't be what I hear in my head, but it'll be pretty close. But so now with technology being so precise, you can basically say, I hear this in my head. I'm going to make it happen on this thing, even down to like the amount of frequency that you're using or even like the amount of quarter steps and, you know, whole whatever types of notes you want to use. You can take an A natural and bend it ever so slightly. And if you want that note, you can get it. And even like more there's a big prevailing uh, music genre called spectralism where you use, you think of music as a spectrum and not, not as like an individualized set of notes. And so people, you composers use computers. Yeah. And they take these computers and are able to create programs that get precise divisions of notes. So instead of dividing the note into half steps and whole steps, you get all these really weird in, like divisions of the, of the note itself. Mm-hmm. And so like, you know, we wouldn't be able to have that without, programming without the use of computers and without these things. And so like technology is one of those things where once somebody figures out how to do something, the like using it in a different way becomes like a source of innovation for music in itself. Mm -hmm. And I think like you can say the same thing for most entertainment genre or not genres, but entertainment types, even like cinema, video games, like books even have printing press. Yeah. I mean, that's another huge thing. Like you don't have, anything without the printing press really but like 
can you, you, you wouldn't have the same things in cinema without someone creating like an animative tool to use for that sort of thing. Right. Yeah. And so like, I think that's one of the coolest things to just recognize. Like modern music is almost based entirely off of technological development that most likely isn't meant to be for music. It's meant to be for something else. And it, it really comes back full circle to that idea where it's somebody creating something for an express purpose and we're reusing it in a different way. Right. Which is often how technology just advances in general. Somebody just finds a different use for something that exists and then they're like, oh, cool, I can use it for this instead. Yeah. Have you guys heard of Meaning Wave? No. No, what is that? So that's, uh, Wait, is this Dan's Dance Facts? Dance Facts. Dance Facts. And now it's time for Dance Facts. It's not really fact. I mean, this is just something that. I want no, to it's add. the bit we made that one episode, and anytime you give us new knowledge, we're going to use it. All right, so I, put in, I already put in the jingle, don't worry. Okay, okay. So yeah, this is a meaning wave is kind of a genre. It's a new genre. It goes with this technology thing that we're talking about. So it's just like a lot of speakers. So I got like Jordan Peterson, Jack Willenick, this dude, Akira the Don, he's the artist. He makes all these meaning wave songs that takes these guys' speeches and puts them into metered sounds and then puts a beat behind it. So it's kind of like its own song. But it's got meaning behind it because it's like actually going off the person's message. Interesting. So it's pretty cool. So it's like just using regular conversation, but they somehow made it so that it sounds like a song. Yeah. Cool. And then they put their whole message behind it. And but but it's cool because like a lot of times you're not going to listen to a person's whole spiel for the whole like forty minutes or whatever. So it's like but when you condense it down into just a cool little song with the hook, with like the verses being the meat of the. The message, it all comes together really nicely. So it sounds like when people sample Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream, but like the entire thing is a song instead of just a little bit of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. Yeah, no, that's it's, pretty it cool. is really cool. So that's what, it, that, that comes together with the technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, like you wouldn't have that sort of expression without taking a technological form and being like, I want to do this with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And that, and I think that's like a really cool thing to think about where, technology as an abstract idea becomes like like a canvas for expressivity and for creativity. I, and I mean, you see it a lot with like, I see it frequently with new music because I'm around it. But like, I was just part of a performance where I used like these things inside the piano to like make new sounds. Like I put a tuning fork inside of a piano and I, I would rub it around. It would make this weird, crazy sound. Dude, that's just ASMR in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> Or like I took a, I took a hammer and I placed it inside the piano and I would go I would I would poke the note while I would move it up and down the strings it would make this kind of alien sort of sort of sound like that and so like you know it's just utilizing tools in like abstract ways oh. and in no way is like a prepared piano like a new thing but it's still cool and it's still something that's completely jarring to anyone who hasn't heard that sort of thing before cowbell hey I'll put it in the piano next time I'll try it out wasn't cowbell Cowbells are just... Cowbells. I know, but are they supposed to just be on their collar and that's kind of where you know where they are, right? Yeah. And somebody was like, I want this on my drum set and started doing <laughs> it instead. I mean, what is what is a drum kit anyways, but just a bunch of shit that someone decided to hit? Yeah, I bet, yeah, right? they probably were just like, this sounds good to hit, this sounds good to hit, let's just have all of it in one spot. Yeah, I mean, like, like that image of like a little kid on the floor with a bunch of pots and pans is exactly what you think yeah, about. Yeah, probably is. So I've, I've always held this opinion, but I think like playing the drums and to a sense playing the piano is just like, it's giving you this primal urge to hit shit yeah. and to make noises and to be really loud. And so like, who doesn't want to play the drums? You get to like make a lot of noise while you're aggressively hitting things. I'm not coordinated enough in my separation of rhythmic timings in each of my limbs to play the drums. Huh? You could, you could just hit You could still hit stuff. Well, that's though. why I took you a could... boxing instead. I don't have to have a rhythm. I just beat the shit out of a bag. I suppose so. What's the difference really besides like, yeah. Okay. You know, next time I'm in the gym and I'll, I'll punch to a, a, a rhythm. Yeah. Dick, dick, dick. And then next time just put... Oh, <laughs> <laughs> next time just put drumsticks in your hands. And yeah. then you, you basically play the drums yeah. after that. I'll just be like, yeah, it's a new CrossFit thing. Yeah. <laughs> I think like our, our conversation about technology wouldn't be complete if we didn't talk about it finally. And maybe not finally, but like as, an, as a brief idea as social in terms media. of... Oh, well, social media, but also oh. medicine. I think medicine, we haven't really touched on too much. But we I talked think, about like market stuff, but we didn't really talk about it in depth. Yeah, I, I think it's always been like one thing to to try and like 
lengthen life in general and to try and make the quality of life better. And uh, it, technology is one of those things that people have been able to use over long periods of time to like do this exact thing, right? And so I think when we think about technological innovation in relation to society, our original question, we also have to consider medicine. Um, modern medicine, being able to do all these crazy things, you know, so things that we take for granted. You know, like, um, who was I talking to? I was talking to someone about like premature birth and how like neonatal things like, you know, for a time were really scary for a lot of people. It's like kids should go this long as a gestation period. But now nowadays, like with that sort of technology, you can basically just make up that time in a sort of artificial placenta or artificial Test womb. Test two babies. Even or yeah, I mean that too is one of those things. Like it solves an issue where people are impotent or can't have kids, and it just makes it possible. Yeah, right. And that that's another beauty about it. It 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 lengthens life, but it also like goes around issues that people have had, but haven't had the ability to figure out yet. Yeah, right. And so like I don't know, it's definitely worth mentioning. Yeah, like you straight up said, there are issues that some people have no way to avoid, but now that technology is at the level where it can be circumvented, it's like, whatever. If you're infertile, then you can have, like, go to a sperm bank or donate to a sperm bank and then have a surrogate mother. And then, like, it's kind of weird, but that's, like, how some people do it. Yeah, and I think that it's... Medicine is one of those things where whenever I think about it, I always think of this, like, beautiful cross between, like, artistry and technology where you have people who are so, like, creative with what they do, but then are also just, like, thinking in ways that are, like totally beyond how we normally think of things. There's like, you can watch videos in 3D of like how surgical procedures go. I've seen one for like how, how to straighten like scoliosis. Yeah. And it's just, it's wild because like they, they take the back and they insert a bunch of pins and then it just straightens it over time. It's like braces for your spine. Yeah. And, and it's just like, that's so incredibly crazy for me because I, I would have I don't think I would have ever thought of that. I would have I wouldn't have thought of like, oh, this guy's back is fucked up. Let's put a bunch of metal rods in there. That'll no. fix it. That seems like the most caveman response to doing anything. Well, one of the things that's crazy to me when I think about it is before we had all this cool technology that let us probe people and like fix them without having to completely tear them apart existed. Like how many people Are you talking about lobotomies because those don't do anything? Well, no, but, <laughs> but I mean like Using, like, x-rays and stuff to see what's going on inside without having to slice your chest open, right? Yeah. Like, how many people probably in the however many years people have been trying to practice medicine, like, have been killed just to try to experiment to see if the procedure or medicine that they're trying to use even worked, right? And There's probably a shit ton of people that died just because somebody was like, hey, we need to figure out if this heart transplant thing works. <laughs> Whoops. All right. And I mean, like, how many undocumented, like, unethical medicinal procedures happened, like, before anything we could have known, right? Yeah. That's why it's a, it's a Halloween trope, the crazy doctor who's just doing crazy things. Yeah, because they want it because, you know, you want to do crazy things. You want to find crazy shit out. I, I want to say in, in relation to that, like, modern anesthesiology, one of the most insane things. Like, yeah. there's a reason why... They get why, paid a lot of money. Yeah, there's a reason why they get paid a lot of money, too, because, like... I always like to, I always get recalled to the, uh, to that image of like a world war, not a world war two vet, like a, a civil war veteran having to have his leg amputated and all you get is like a piece of wood <laughs> and you're just like, okay, it's going to suck for like three minutes. Here you go. <laughs> Wait, quick tangent. There was this doctor. He was known as being the quickest like amputation of like in, in all of America. Okay. And <laughs> except there's one time he was doing an amputation. He did it so quick that he cut off the assisting nurse's finger. <laughs> and then both of them died. Oh, no. Yeah, it's because of gangrene. And oh, so, he fucked up. Yeah, he really did. Did he lose his practicing license? I mean, I don't know if practicing license were a thing. That's one of those times where it's like, are Oops. you a doctor? I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> and I wearing the people thing. open and they don't die, so I guess. Do you know anyone else who has this amount of tools yeah. and knives? Somebody like, was like, let's hold fire to them and it close up the wounds. Yeah, okay. God, cauterizing is so good. weird. I, I, I don't know, man. Like, There's that. I I had another image, too, that I wanted to remember, but I, I've lost it in that train of thought. Oh, well, well, when you're lost train of thought, I want to bring up the point really quick that it, because you said the word cauterize, yeah. it made me think of the conflict in continuity that Star Wars has. Oh, my God. Where lightsabers right. are supposed to cauterize the wounds, which they do, but it was episode four, right? When, oh, uh, when, Greedo, when Obi-Wan cuts yep. off Greedo's and arm, it, just bleeds, it out. bleeds on the floor. 
because I guess they didn't have the idea that it's supposed to cauterize the wound and make you stop bleeding right away. Or, I mean, Obi-Wan's lightsaber was just completely archaic and they didn't have the technology yeah, it was to just cauterize. A piece of, it was just a piece of metal. It was just metal actually just a glowy sword. That, yeah, yeah, with some LEDs very, attached. Yeah, it was just a very reflective, like, steel, steel sword. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, that's all I wanted to talk about. Yeah, nice tangent. Thank you. But I think, like... Modern medicine in itself is like one of those beautiful things, and I mean, you you run into these issues of like, you know, now you're along you're elongating life so much, and not, and then you start trying to treat for comfortability too, mm-hmm. like you know, looking towards hospice sort of things, and it's I mean, nobody wants to think about that, yeah. but like it is it is a business nowadays too, like mm-hmm. dying peacefully and dying comfortably is like a thing. Yeah, people have to rent out room in graveyards because we're running out of room to put people into the ground. Yeah. So that's why a lot of people opt instead to get, uh, uh, what am I talking about? Incinerated, cremated, incinerated. I was thinking of incineroar (laughs) for some reason, but yeah, incinerated. Another good example of how technology has changed another different industry. Yeah. Right. Like, you know, before this, I mean, I'm guessing that like burning someone alive was an option. Viking, Viking, witches, you know, whatever you think. But I think, like, the sort of efficiency that it's afforded nowadays is totally different. Yeah. Yeah. You see, this sort of conversation is kind of like how technology as, like, a uh, as a concept is just... It's just sort of, huge, yeah, because we keep it's, going on tangents. And they're, and they're all relevant to the topic. Yeah, and so. I mean, like, I, I struggle to think of any sort of uh, topic of conversation that isn't relevant towards this. Yeah. Like... You can always tie it back somehow. Technology will always be a thing. And this is, like, the last point I have to make, at least for right now, before we get... Uh, like, before we have this conversation again is that like i think nowadays you know of course technology is so rooted in every other thing we do and i think it's just insane how you can't really do much without it it's been so assimilated into like the small things that we do every day that it's like i'm not sure that we'd be able to like do very much without modern technology even down to like really small things and the one that always gets me whenever i do it is like whenever i use like a debit card I was listening to a podcast that was all about like we're moving away from paper money and completely towards electronic money. And I, I was having this moment today where I put my card in to pay for parking and I was like, This this little card holds all of my like imaginary money. Yeah. All of my imaginary <laughs> numbers. Wealth. All yeah, of all of numbers. my imaginary numbers <laughs> like are in this little square rect or this rectangle. Not a square. It's in this little rectangle. And it's like if I if I misplace this rectangle, all of the numbers that I have go away. Yeah, or it's, if somebody steals it, which they do try to do, yeah, and all their all your imaginary numbers are their imaginary and, and numbers. It's, it's just insane that like every little interaction you have on a regular basis is completely rooted in some sort of technological innovation. At least nowadays. And that's not any sort of comment about how like Oh, we we're so like stuck in technology, and it's we terrible. We live in for a it. society. Oh my god! I that <laughs> it's like uh, we haven't made like a Reddit comment of the day, but like you know, is this a, it? Is this the Reddit? This comment? is the one right here. Hey. Do you know about r slash phones are bad? No. That's a that's so that's the one I keep thinking of. Where it's like it's always some comic about how like this generation uses its phones all the time. Or, As the guy probably posted it from his smartphone. That's what I'm saying. Or like <laughs> like something about reading is, is so much better than using your phone and like, or go like being outside. Okay. Can we talk about that really quick? Okay. 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 Did, did your parents ever say this to you guys where there are just like adults in general, like stop looking at the computer screen, go read a book. And I'm like, what am I going to open up my chemistry book and gain something out of that? I do my reading online now. Like you said, I kind do. of hi- find it hard to imagine to read articles out of a newspaper just because our generation grew up with this being all digitalized now on a screen, right? Yeah. But like, as much as it might be kind of weird to say or hear it, Reddit is kind of my newspaper, and it's just a different form of the technology that existed before with newspapers. But now it's just in a screen that's super accessible to me, and that's why I use it instead. I, I will provide like a little bit of a caveat to that, where it's like I do think that like the u- using screens and like the sort of exposure to blue light kind of fucks with a lot of yeah. things. Right. I mean, but that's going in like different nuances. I'm just talking about like, yeah, but general. I think like as a, as an entirety, it's not like you can't read things. I mean, how many people use a Kindle or how many people read yeah. things on their phone? Audiobooks, or audiobooks are a sort of thing. thing I mean, or how many people have like, you know, they have their iPad with their entire book on it. I've seen musicians who keep all of their music on just an iPad oh, yeah. and there's a little pedal that you attach to it. And you you tap the pedal, it flips the page for you. 
Yeah. It's it's crazy. It's like one of the most insane things, but it's so useful and like it's it's like I don't like that argument about, you know, phones are bad as a as a concept just because it's like I'm not trying to like say no to new things. Like change right. is always fine and if it makes things easier then that's fine. I'll always appreciate physicality and sort of things like I mean I'm a I'm a purist with paper books I like to have it in front of me because then I have a sort of physical sensation of, fe- of feeling how much I've read yeah. but other than that it's like I read the news online I'm not trying to like have more paper in my hand not all the time and yeah. so I don't know in that sort of sense like trying to compare like using your phone to anything else always has like just immediate pitfalls because you're not making a real argument you're just like saying things yeah yeah but man having books on your phone brings us to our sponsor audible (laughs) i'm just kidding i wish we did i was really trying to find a segue into that i was like oh but really audible if you want to give us like some money if you want to give us we'll chill out for you (laughs) i'll read i'll take an entire podcast and read like half a book in a really dramatic voice too there's your free advertising yeah, except except we have to we have to put it with the uh, the ukulele music. <laughs> but too. I didn't have anything to say further. Okay, you know what? You I'm didn't gonna, you didn't do I'm a pitch retroactively right now. add a, a an ad bit just for them. Really? All right? Yeah. Okay, I'm it. gonna trust you on this because yeah. I did the last day. Future me, future Aaron, put in the audible audible ad. Audible lets you listen to other people read books to you, so you don't have to do it yourself, you lazy bum. That's just crazy. Audible is offering a free audiobook when you start a 30-day trial by going to audible.com forward slash we don't have a promo code. Once again, that's audible.com forward slash I can't afford rent. Thanks, Audible. I liked, okay. I still think that our, uh, that our home chef one was I'm the so best I'm so happy one. that was That was me. just the, uh, that was excellent. I was, was cracking excellent. up so much when we did that yeah. one. Yeah, home chef, another technology thing. Mm-hmm. Everything is technology. Yeah. I think the only thing you take away from this conversation is that all things are technology. Yeah. Right? And that nothing is sacred, all things are dead. I was going to go on... <laughs> oh, God is dead. <laughs> I was going to go on a whole other tangent about... Because uh, right when you said that delivery stuff, I was like, Amazon was a game changer. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Amazon. Malls are shutting down and losing business because Everyone home just, delivery is just super easy. Let's even think about like Cyber Monday. Everyone does Black Friday, but like just the sort of fervor that you have with Cyber Mondays, like, and it, it completely changes the game. Now that you can buy things online instead of having to like go to a store and physically wait for shit, like mm-hmm. totally different. Everything is different because of because of that sort of technological innovation. Yeah. Why do you think people all the time are now like we won't even need cashiers because there are kiosks that you just or like yeah. self service s- lanes, self driving cars, self driving cars, everything yeah. like everything gets automated. Yeah. Right, and it's really insane to think about like how much how much less you have to do every like every so often. And then that brings up a whole nother issue with things like basic income, living yeah. income. But that's like a whole different thing. Yeah. But you shall know that the robot uprising is coming. And I welcome it. We welcome our ro- new robot overlords. When Siri asks me a question instead, <laughs> I'm going to be ready for it. So yeah. uh, with with worship You'd and like, songs of praise. Siri, what time is breakfast? And so you go... No, JP, what time <laughs> am I free? Like, <gasps> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> like I said, I'm going to welcome Siri's new sentient lifestyle with songs of praise. Mm-hmm. Maybe a few hymns that I've created myself. Yeah. Yeah. They'll get the best of my technologically advanced music degree. So. It's <laughs> kind of all I got, though. Do you guys have anything else? No, I mean, this conversation is so wide and it's got such a breath and I think that we'll just end up talking forever <laughs> inevitably we'll come back to it you know we'll do like a, we'll have to do a recap just because so many things happen with it and like most likely we'll find more things that relate us all to like how prevalent technology is and how like how it affects our everyday lives yeah and I mean like the things that this conversation really brought to me and I hope to everyone else is the things that I had mentioned that you it's really inseparable with anything we do nowadays I'm looking around where we're at and there's like you know, there's some sort of like technology thing that mm-hmm. I, that I know I'm going to use and that is completely normal for me. The house we're recording this in would not have been built had it not been for the advancements in technology. The Otherwise, we'd be in caves and huts. Or even like the computers that we're using right now. These are so normalized that like, you know, you don't even bet an eye when you see one. It's mm-hmm. just like a thing. And then the other thing that I just, you know, can't help but think is like, the the idea that like technology in itself is like an innovative tool but then like just how 
I guess, prevalent marketability is with most things, especially nowadays. Like, if you try and think about any sort of innovation, you almost can't separate it from mar- from the market. You can't se- separate it from money being, is always involved. Yeah, somehow. you can't separate it from being a selling point, and that's one of those things that I think everyone needs to remember with most technology is that like. You know, it's not like it's inherent evil where it's like the NSA listening through you, listening to you through your phone or like Instagram listening to you through the phone and trying to sell you things based on what you say, which I believe. Which they do. I believe it. I was one time talking about toothbrushes and then it saw ads for toothbrushes there on my is. phone. I don't need that. I know. I already know what type <laughs> of toothbrush I like to buy. I don't need Instagram telling me I have to buy this weird new f- toothbrush. I don't give a shit. But so it's that sort of thing where like... It's not technology that's evil around you and uh, trying to like grasp at you and all these things. It's more just about like everything that you have technology wise has been sold to you in some way, shape or form. And it's been sold to you in such a subtle and dubious, not maybe not dubious, but like a way that makes it seem like you absolutely need it. Right. Yeah. Where, where it's like one of those things that it's a necessity to live, but really it's, it's not anything more than like. It's a either it's things. a necessity that you need to live or you'll be less cool than the person next to you that does have it. But even then, that's still a necessity. Yeah, yeah. Or, well, it's, I'm just saying. or it's one of multiple necessities that you need to make your life run more smoothly. To get even more meta with it, which I think is like kind of obnoxious, it's like we bought these microphones that we're using because it's a necessity for this thing we like to do. Yeah, pretty much. So, yeah, basically. <laughs> I mean, we don't have the recording quality without Go it. Go look at our first couple of episodes. Yeah, honestly. That, that, that <laughs> is a quality mess. and that shit. <laughs> <laughs> Just remember that, everyone. The marketability of all things sold to you is one of the key things that ties us into technology regularly. Technology isn't evil. It's just like the, how we yeah. how we come into it can sometimes be unethical. Yeah. Yeah. Technology is everywhere. And that's it's, just, it's you got to embrace it. And that's just how it is. That's yeah. just how it be. It's an incredible feat and everything about yep. it is great, but it is just everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, there you go, Tim. There's your, <laughs> there's your whole episode that we somehow managed to dedicate just for you. Yeah. So you're welcome on, on that one. Yeah. Which opens up the floor to if anyone else has things that we, we want, that they want us to talk about. I'm game for anything. Yes. Oh, yeah. Thanks for being our first actual person to yeah, give honestly, us feedback we and need to, make us talk about I feel like we, should we did him, it. We do it. I feel like we should give him some sort of, like, merch now. Um, we don't need <laughs> merch. What are we going to give him? Tuft of my hair? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I mean, <laughs> we, right, it's the first thing we have at this point. That's true. Get a picture of me, Dan, and Aaron. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, it'll say, howdy. <laughs> <laughs> a bunch of crazy cowboys. Yeah. <laughs> These are the things that you could hope for by interacting with us. (laughs) (laughs) Oh boy, this is what happens when it starts to get late. (laughs) Anyways, that's all we have. So, uh, until next time, guys. Bye. Dan, say bye. Bye.